Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tracy Jones. Welcome to the Tremendous Leadership Podcast. Today's guest is world-renowned leadership expert, Dr. Ken Blanchard, written 65 books, sold over 23 million copies, and we are so excited to hear him share what it takes to pay the price of leadership. You're listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tracy Jones with the Tremendous Leadership Podcast. And this series is called Leaders on Leadership, where we pull back the curtain on what it really takes to be a leader. Today, I have the tremendous honor and privilege of having Dr. Ken Blanchard as our guest. Dr. Ken Blanchard is one of the most influential leadership experts in the world. He's the co-author of the iconic bestsellers, The One Minute Manager and The New One Minute Manager, as well as 65 other books whose combined sales total more than 23 million copies. He's the co-founder with his wife, Margie, of the Ken Blanchard Companies. He's an international management training and consulting firm, and this is located in San Diego, California. He also co-founded Lead Like Jesus, a worldwide organization committed to helping people become servant leaders. Ken has received numerous awards and honors for his contributions in the fields of management, leadership, and speaking, to include being my reader on my PhD. And Ken, I am just so excited to have you as a guest today. Well, good. What a joy it is for me too, Tracy. So uh, bless you and hope we'll bless uh, the people who are listening. Absolutely. Well, Ken, you knew my father. You knew him very, very well. And you you had so many things in common. And you are one of the world's renowned leadership experts. And my father just adored leadership, was a, a constant student of it. And he wrote a book called The Price of Leadership where he talked about the price that a leadership a leader has to pay um, to sit in the chair of leadership. And the first price that he talked about was loneliness. And my father would say that the leader a lot of times has to set the pace and lead the way for others to follow. And that means he has to separate himself or herself from the crowd because there's nobody that can lead your group the way that you can do it. So can you talk to me about in leadership, you know, we think of the great man theory and, you know, standing up there in the accolades, but can you share with me uh, times when you have felt uh, the loneliness of leadership, you know, they say it's lonely at the top, or how a, leader sh- how a leader processes loneliness that may be different than the other type of loneliness that we feel in our lives. Well, Tracy, you know, I, don't, I can't ever remember being lonely mm-hmm. because one of the keys of the one minute manager is uh, once goals are clear, your job is to get out of your office and wander around, wander <laughs> around and see if you can cheer people on. And so, uh, how can you be lonely when you're running around and cheering your people on and Mm. having some fun with them and all. You're not telling them what to do and managing them. You're just kind of saying, add a boy, add a girl. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need any help, let me know. And so uh, I I just don't feel lonely. A lot of people say, have you felt lonely during this pandemic? I said, no, I've been on the phone (laughs) with people I haven't talked to for years. And I've learned technology. I mean, this Zooming stuff is just unbelievable. Uh, You know, I mean, we had a Zoom call company meeting with 250 people on it yes. from around the world. Isn't that just amazing? It is incredible. Absolutely. And so is there a time, Ken, where you felt like you had to kind of step out from everybody else? Because I know you have a tremendous team of supporters. Um, has there ever been a time where you kind of realized, hey, I see it, everybody else may not see it, and I kind of need to move, out, move on out ahead of everybody? Well, I think that's part of leadership is that first, you know, you need to set the vision and direction. And that sometimes is stepping out uh, there. You know, I'm I'm a big fan, as you know, of servant leadership. And a lot of people think that that's about the inmates running the prison or trying to, you know, please everybody and all. But there's two parts of servant leadership. And the first one is vision and direction, you know, and values and goals, you know. And that's where the leader's got to be out front, Mm. you know, not that you, do those all by yourself, but you got to make sure that that's out front in people. This is why we're in this business. This is what we hope to accomplish. This is the values that are going to guide our behavior. These are the goals we want you to focus on, on right now. And so that's a that's the leadership part of servant leadership. And then once that's done, then you move to the servant part of servant leadership, 
And now you philosophically turn that pyramid upside down and now you work for them. You're cheering them on. You're uh, seeing what you can do to help them win and all that kind of thing. So I, I think that's what uh, the two big parts of leadership are all, is all about. And so uh, I don't know, I've just never been that lonely as a leader. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that. And and I love I love that you talked about servant leadership. It isn't about um, abdicating the leadership role, but it's like you said, you know, I mean, and I think because intrinsically you understand leaders have the responsibility or the shoulder of um, setting the vision. But there are some people in leadership positions that are scared of that, scared to make a decision. And so when they step out for that first time, um, it becomes really kind of scary because they feel like, well, everybody should be marching alongside me. And sometimes there could be a little bit of a lag time there. Well, the big issue, uh, Tracy, on, on that whole loneliness maybe thing is, is the ego. Mm. You know, we call that edging God out or everything good outside. And there's two ways that the ego comes into play. One is false pride. When you have a more than philosophy, you think you're brighter than and all. And so you could care less about what, what they think, you know, you're charging on with everything, you know. <clears throat> and uh, the other one is fear of self doubt, you know, which comes from a less than philosophy. And, and you don't want to be seen, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you're probably hiding in your office and, you know, <clears throat> and so what we need to do is get people out of their own way. We've started a 12-step Egos Anonymous program, you know, because I think it's the biggest addiction it is. there is. And the way you yeah. overcome false pride is with, with humility. And a lot of mm -hmm. people think that's a, mm -hmm. a weakness. But I think it was C.S. Lewis or some people say, you know, it was Rick Warren who said, people with humility don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves less. Right. So, uh, and the way to overcome a fear or self-doubt is to trust the unconditional love of God because God just loves you no matter uh, what. And if you feel comfortable with who you are, you know, then you're really out there with people, not to manage them, but to cheer them on and to make sure that uh, they know where they're headed and what you're trying to accomplish and, and helping them get there. Well, based on what you said then, you, um, I remember reading Power Positive Thinking, and that was the main theme. How can you be negative when you are made in God and know God loves you? So, and t I was talking to Don Hudson's wife, Terry Murphy, earlier on this. Uh, we recorded her interview earlier today, and that was the same sh thing she said. When you have these values and you're so committed to them, you may not have people physically with you yet. Um, but that is your, um, that's your, that, that's what leads you and lets you know that, Hey, you are going to get through this. And you did allude to that in your initial answer. Sometimes when we are so convinced of the right way to go, you just have such clarity that it, that you just, you just lead the path and, uh, and others will follow. Um, but those values, when you're really dialed in, not to self, mm -hmm. but to a higher calling, that loneliness isn't as important because you know, you have a higher purpose and you're going to start, start to go along your way. Well, Robert Greenleaf was considered the modern, uh, you know, father of servant leadership. Although I look at Jesus as the real father of servant leadership. But Greenleaf said, you need to serve first and lead second, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, in terms of emphasis. And you mentioned normal, Norman Vincent Peale. What a wonderful opportunity I had to <clears throat> write a book with him mm. when he was 86 years old. We wrote mm -hmm. The Power of Ethical Management, Integrity Pays, You Don't Have to Cheat to Win. And Norman constantly said that positive thinkers get positive results. Right. And so if you feel positive about yourself and other people, you're going to get those great results. Right. And you're going to draw those great people that resonate with that. Um, now, the second price that, that my dad talked about was weariness. And uh, you've been doing this a long time. And my dad always said, you know, Tracy, anytime you do anything worthwhile in life, you're going to have some people that do way more than is expected and some people that do way less than expected. How do you handle the pace and um, handle, again, there's good loneliness and there's bad loneliness. There's good weariness and there's bad weariness that just, you know, depresses you. How do you, how do you keep going on, Ken? How do you replenish yourself? Well, I think that uh, the whole weariness thing is, is that you're, into your job and your work all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> one of the things I learned from Norman is that we have two selves. 
we have an external task oriented self that's used to getting jobs done. Mm -hmm. And then you have a thoughtful reflective self. Now, which of those selves wakes up quicker in the morning? Hmm. You know, the alarm goes off and John Ortberg, who's a great pastor said, why don't we call that the opportunity clock or it's gonna be a great day clock. No alarm, <laughs> and immediately, you know, hits your task oriented self and you jump out of bed, you know, and you're eating while you're trying to get dressed and you jump in your car and you're on the car phone, and you're racing here, there, and all around meetings and all, and you get home at night, you're absolutely exhausted, fall into bed, don't have the energy to say goodnight to somebody who might be lying next to you. <laughs> next day, boom, you're out of there again, and you're caught in a rat race. And I love Lily Talman, the great Hollywood philosopher. She said, the problem with the rat race is even if you win it, you're still a rat. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the, uh, one of the ways that I battle weariness is I enter my day slowly, mm. you know, in solitude, in prayer, in reading good stuff. I, you know, I read the Daily Word and mm -hmm. Jesus Calling and, and uh, some scriptures and all. And then I think about my day. I, I read my mission statement and, and uh, my values and all and say, okay. How do I want to be today? You know, wow. and so, you know, you might say, well, how do I, you get the extra time? Well, you, you need to also go to bed reasonably, you know, mm -hmm. don't stay up till, and Margie and I are always in bed by nine o'clock and, and then we're up by, you know, five thirty, quarter to six, you know, and so we have plenty of time to kind mm -hmm. of enter our, our day and all. And so wow. I think you need to get as much done as you possibly can, but, but don't get fanatical about it so that mm -hmm. you don't, get any sleep or, or any of the things like that. And I think, uh, you know, weariness again is a choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think the way you really are weary is when you're doing something you don't love to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that the important thing is to find something you love to do and you'll never have to work another day in your life. Right. So I think the reason why your father and I have always had tremendous energy is that we've always loved mm -hmm. what, we've, what we've done, you know, mm -hmm. and then phew, you fire out of bed, let's go, you know, and right, you know, but but uh, we also constantly are in prayer and talking to the Lord and mm -hmm. quieting ourselves, right? Well, and that's what he'd tell me growing up because our vacations were we'd go on book speaking engagements with him, and he's like, Work is more fun than fun, fun is more fun than work, you know what I'm saying? So it was this blend of he loved what he was doing, so and it was, it, I just love how he rolled it all together. Um, but I love the alarm clock, I mean, that, that is that's incredible. Why do we call it that? So, Ken, you get up early and you do your devotions, and then you said you read your mission statement and get and get phone focused in again on what you're about today, what your purpose is, and yes. what you're going to serve and do. Okay, yes. awesome. I yeah, have my, never heard My that. mission is to be a loving teacher and example of simple truths. Wow. It helps myself and others to awaken to the presence of God in our lives. Man. So we realize that we're here to serve, not to be served. Uh, and uh, so if I remember that, I'm into simple truths and wanting to help people to get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. and to realize, you know, that uh, they're here to serve, to be served, you know, and what did Jesus say? He said, even I have come to serve, not to be served. Right. Well, that brings us to the third price of leadership, which is abandonment. And that point, my father always said, we need to abandon what we like to think about and want to think about, to think about in favor of what we need to think about and what we ought to think about. So you're, you sharing that about your mission focus, that really orients your day, not only the devotional, the quiet time to replenish your soul and the, the internal reflective self, but then that mission statement, that helps you really get clarity on on what conversations you need to have because there's tons of stuff trying to pull yeah. us off mission all day long. So, can, right. you know, yeah. How do you stay focused on that? I love that mission statement. I, I, that's, well, that's you know, huge. one of the things about uh, that whole, whole thing about, uh, you know, what do you make choices on and all that is <clears throat> I never was a much of a journal writer, you know, because mm -hmm. I have friends who write in, you know, journals in three or four colors and they write poetry and all. And then I had a, buddy of mine, you know, Bill Hybels, who uh, founded the uh, uh, Willow Creek Community Presbyterian Church, or church and, and he said, Blanchard, you've goofed up my life for a long time, and now you're even goofing my uh, writing of journals, you know, because uh, what he was realizing, he was the uh, chaplain for the Chicago Bears, and, and after Bible study, the, the coach would 
go over the game films and talk about what they did well and then what they need to work on and do better. And so he taught me is that, so now I have a journal that I put the date and I put in the top of it and then do it at the end of the day, praisings. Mm. What did I do today that's consistent with who I wanted to be mm. and wow. do you know, all. And then redirections, which is, okay, what, what did I do that I, I wish I hadn't done or you know, might set up an apology and all. <clears throat> and that gives you your abandonment list, I think. Yeah, uh, oh my gosh. And because uh, if things keep on popping up on that, <laughs> redirection yeah. list then you need you know you need to help and set a goal on that i need to let go of that and abandon that well that's incredible because i one of the things that in the in the uh doctoral program was we had to focus on a fruit of the spirit we wanted to uh, grow in and of course as a hard charger type a mine was contentment and so i did at the end of the day my contentment journal where i listed 25 ways that i had seen god show up or just the blessings you know every day but i love the flip side of that because my dad always told me yes for all the successes you had today there's things that you did that are contributing to your failures and are still holding you back so i love that you called them redirections right right yeah because that's, that's what, brilliant one minute praisings and one minute redirects wow <laughs> we changed the the name and the re, uh, the new that's, one minute manager <laughs> from one minute reprimand to one minute redirects because it's more consistent it is one of the things that we found tracy and today is top-down leadership is no longer relevant mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. And what people want is they want side-by-side -side leadership, mm -hmm. particularly young people. Not that they want your job, but they want to know that they can contribute something. And so, mm -hmm. you know, people ask me, what's the biggest quality to be a great leader today is to listen more than talk mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and be there to help people and find out how they're doing and all. Even, you know, when you're praising somebody, uh, you might say, I saw you did this uh, how are you feeling about it too? You know, I mean, not just tell them, tell them how you feel. How do they feel about it? You know, right. to keep the ball in their court as much as they want. Uh, you know, what do they say? That if God wanted us to speak more than listen, he would have given us two mouths. <laughs> and I love the redirect because then if there's something where you said we need to apologize or talk, because one of the most terrible things a leader can do is not address something right away yeah. or a spouse can do let stuff just harbor and go underground because then it just it metastasizes and it blows up so i love that it keeps you at the end of the day you know forgive us our sins you know at the every day we have to go back and say this is what i good did good and this is what needs quote redirected so oh, ken thank you so much for that yeah. that's absolutely brilliant oh and i i wrote a book with margaret mcbride who was my literary agent for years we call it the fourth secret of the one minute manager, the one minute apology. Oh. Because, you know, if you realize as you reflect on the day that you did something particularly to somebody else, that you, you know, you want to go right away and apologize. And when you apologize to somebody, you know, you're not asking them to, to forgive you and all. It's really coming from you mm -hmm. and to get this out of you, but also to share with them that this was so unlike you. Mm -hmm. you know, as far as you're concerned. And, and please uh, give me feedback if I ever do this again. Right. Well, and then you pre you prevent them from becoming alienated followers. You know what I'm saying? When, when they were once in love with the organization, all of a sudden they feel like they got thrown under the bus. Or even yeah. as a newlywed, you know, you, you, you were in love at one time, but all you need is those little bars to, to stay unaddressed and you slowly start diverging and realizing, hey, this other person doesn't respect or value me. So, I mean, that, that's brilliant. The one minute, you said the, the, fourth, the fourth secret was yeah. the one minute uh, apology. Apology, yeah. One of the things that Margie and I, we, this will be 58 years uh, at, at the end of this month. Oh, my gosh. That we agreed that we never would go to bed uh, angry, you know. Mm -hmm. we, would, we would stay up all night if we had a, an area we needed to, to deal with, although, but I married way above myself, so, and so did your dad, you know. He did. Margie. <laughs> But, well, congratulations uh, on 58. Uh, yeah, you, you want to over-communicate rather than under-communicate. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Dad would always say, whenever somebody would say whatever year, if you told him 58, he'd say, 
oh, that's the worst year, you know, because he had been married so long and he was just so silly about that. So that's yeah, absolutely yeah. wonderful. All <laughs> right. Over communicate. Yep. Can't be enough of that. So th thank you for that. Again, and then the last price that he talked about was vision. And I think people looking at you with the 65 books and 25 are like, well, Ken's a visionary. Okay. And what he, my dad talks about in the price of leadership, and my dad would clearly say it to everybody, um, he wasn't um, this incredibly brilliant man. He flunked out of school in the eighth grade. He came from really uh, rough background, poverty. Um, but he called vision somebody that sees what needs to be done and then does it. So a lot of people see what needs to be done, but they don't take action. So can you share with me how you gain clarity or how you help um, people uncover their vision or how, how you got clarity or an epiphany in your career? I know you've talked about the different ebbs and flows of running an organization. Can you share with me where you had a vision that maybe changed or you had to readopt it? Well, uh, it's interesting, you know, first of all, you need to get a sense of your own personal vision, you know, mm. and you know, what, what business are you in when I, and I mentioned my, my mission statement. And in fact, I just did a thing for ATD, our national conference on uh, how to uh, develop a compelling personal mission uh, statement or mm. vision statement. And uh, people can get that from ATD, but uh, I work, work them through a process because it's really, important to know who you are yeah. and where you're going and what's going to guide your journey uh, and, and all that. But then the same goes for your organization and, and the rest of your life is what happens is that sometimes you have a, a vision about where you're going to go and something happens, you know, I mean, uh, so it was really uh, interesting, you know, when I was uh, in, in school and, and, uh, I decided that I, I wanted to be a dean of students, you know, and I, and uh, all that kind of thing and work with students. And, and, but I wanted to be a faculty member, you know. Mm -hmm. But when I was getting my doctor's degree, you'll get a kick out of it, my faculty said that I really couldn't write, you know, that if I wanted to uh, be at a university, I needed to be a full-time administrator, not a, not a teacher, you know. Mm -hmm. And so my first job I got was administrative assistant to the the dean of the business school at Ohio University with a fellow member, Harry Edwards and Evers. And when I got there, he said, Ken, I want you to teach a course. You know, I want all my deans to teach a course. And I never thought about teaching because, you know, in, in universities, if you can't publish, you perish, you know. And uh, he said, I don't care anything about it. I want to teach, you know. And so Paul Hersey had just arrived as chairman of the management department at Ohio University. So he put me in Hersey's department. And I taught a basic management course. And uh, I had done a doctoral dissertation on Fred Fiedler, who was the first situational leadership theorist. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so after a couple of weeks, I came home and told my wife, Margie, I said, God, this is what I ought to do is teach. This is really fun. Mm -hmm. She said, what about the writing? I said, I don't know, we'll figure something out. And so I had heard Hersey taught a great course on leadership. And so I stopped him in December 66 and said, Paul, could I sit in on your class next semester? And he said, uh, nobody audits my course. If you want to take it, uh, take it for credit. You know, and he walked away. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I had a PhD and he didn't. And he <laughs> wants me to take his course for credit. See? So I told Margie and she said, well, is he any good? I said, he's supposed to be great. She said, well, get your ego out of the way and take his damn course. Yeah. You know? yeah. And uh, so uh, I had to talk to the registrar into letting me in. So I signed up and I wrote all the papers and all. And in June 67, Hersey comes in my course and he said, Ken, I've been teaching leadership for 10 years. I think I'm better than anybody. He said, but, uh, you know, writing has never been my uh, big skill area and all. And I, I enjoy it and all, but I've, they want me to write a textbook. And I've been looking for a co-author and I found one in you. You're such a good writer. <laughs> I went, he read my papers, you know. Wow. And uh, he said, would you think about writing it with me? And I said, wow, we ought to be a great team, you know. And so we wrote this Management of Organizational Behavior. Mm -hmm. and it's now in its 10th edition. I think it sells more today than it did back in the 60s. So I went to the dean <laughs> and told him, I said, I quit as an administrator. I'm going to be a faculty member. I got a book coming out. See? And he said, you can't quit. I said, why not? He said, because I was going to fire you because oh. you're a lousy administrator, which I am. <laughs> oh so uh, when, in fact, when we started our company, Margie became the president. She's so much better at doing that. I'm just mm -hmm. a head cheerleader, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all that. A little bit like your dad, I think. He was right. a big cheerleader. Absolutely. And, uh, 
but you know, I mean, you know, here I had a thing I was going to do, and all of a sudden the the game changed because they mm -hmm. told me I couldn't do that, and then I did that, and somebody, else, you know, I mean, life is really what happens to you when you're planning on doing something else, you know. And, I uh, had no idea. I had no idea that's how you came out with that first book, which everyone yeah. knows and references. I even re re uh, referenced in my dissertation. Yeah. That's and incredible. When we, went to, when we went to California on sabbatical leave, uh, Adelaide Brie, who was a wonderful writer, she wrote visualizations directing the movies of your mind. You know, she was one of the first people on self-curing of cancer. And she decided to have a party of authors in San Diego. And I got invited because of my textbook. And we get there and Margie meets Spencer Johnson. Oh my Spencer goodness. Spencer had written all these children's books with his yes. wife. The Value Tales series, The Value of Courage, the story of, of Jackie Robinson, The Value of Believing in Yourself, the story of Helen Keller, and you know, The Value of Honesty, the story of Abe Lincoln. And so Margie hand carries him over and says, you guys ought to write a children's book for managers. They won't read anything else. <laughs> and so Spencer's writing a one minute uh, scolding uh, thing with a psychiatrist on how to discipline kids. So I invited him to a seminar I was doing. You know, he was writing that for parenting. And and he sat in the back and laughed and all and came running up at the end. He said, forget parenting. Let's do the one minute manager. <laughs> and since he was a children's book writer and I'm a storyteller, we decided to write a parable. But I mean, right. who would have ever thunk it? You know, we finished that book and, and uh, self-published it initially because nobody knew us in New York. And we sold 20,000 copies with no advertising to right. through the Young President's Organization. Then we went to, to New York and we had a record, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, my God, we're on the Today Show and, and uh, you know, September 1962 and go on the bestseller list the next week and never go off for two or three years. Mm -hmm. You know, I started my whole parable writing and you say, why do I write 65 books? Well, they're all short. Right. <laughs> Dad loved stories. that. Those are, those are our best sellers. I mean, you know, leaders are busy and we keep them just, you know, an hour and a half, two hours to read. There's, there's no excuse for not reading them. That's right. Yeah. I love it. Awesome. Well, Ken, is there anything else as we wrap up our time here that you would like to share with, we've got leaders that are just dying to hear your wisdom on what it really takes a leader to be a leader or the price of leadership that you paid. Any final comments or thoughts you want to share with our listeners? Well, I think the biggest thing is to realize that leadership is not about you. It's about the people that you're serving. Mm -hmm. And uh, with servant leadership, John Maxwell uh, wrote the, the uh, forward to a, to a book that uh, I wrote, which was got all the key people in the field to write their thoughts on servant leadership. It's called Servant Leadership in Action. So I got Lori Beth Jones and Simon Sinek and Brene Brown and Marshall Goldsmith and Patrick Lencioni and, you know, you name it, you know. And but what uh, John said in the forward is that the only way to get great results and great human satisfaction is through servant leadership. Uh, and I think people, you know, it's, it's not uh, a soft uh, form of leadership because you have vision and direction starts it and then you move to the servant part. And so my big command is the world is in desperate need of a different leadership role model. Mm -hmm. We've seen what self-serving leaders have done in every sector of society. You know, mm -hmm. we're even seeing some of it in Washington, you know, where they're not solving problems. They're, they're fighting on who's going to get elected, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, what we really need is people that are there to serve, not to, to be served. And you, right. when you see companies where they get it, you know, people say, Blanchard, who does what you are always thinking about, you know, and teaching. I said only the winning companies like Southwest Airlines and the airline and Nordstrom's in retail, Disney and entertainment, Wegmans in the grocery business, Sonovas in financial services, you know, Starbucks and the coffee. You know, they're all leaders of their field and all of the people that run those realize that this is important. Your number one customer is your people. And if you take care of your people, train them, love on them, support them, they will go out of the way to take care of your number two most important customer, the people buy your products and services, and they will become raving fans of you and become part of your sales force. And that takes care of the third group you need to worry about, the owners and the financial uh, people. 
Right. And a lot of people think you're in business to make profit. No, profit is the applause you get mm. for creating a motivating environment for your people so they'll take good care of your customers. And boy, mm -hmm. remember that out there uh, for sure. Absolutely. Ken, thank you so much. Ken, how can people get a hold of you? Oh, they can get a hold of me from uh, at our uh, KenBlanchard.com. Okay. Uh, and then I also have leadlikejesus.com because you want to do that. That's a ministry all over the world and that's headquarters in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Our Blanchard company is out in uh, California. I wanted to make sure that people right. didn't want to get all those things confused and, and all, but uh, Jesus is the greatest servant leader of all time, greatest yes, leader of all time. And, and uh, so that's really been a, been a fun uh, journey. And, and, uh, uh, we also have a website, I think, is BlanchardBooks.com. If you okay. want to oh, go look at all, all the books that we have. And, and uh, your dad certainly helped me uh, get going on a, on a bunch of stuff. And, and, uh, and I would recommend they all find out more about uh, tremendous books and, and your dad's writings and all, because he was one of the greatest human beings that ever lived. And uh, so is your mom. And now I'm glad that they're together. I am uh, too. Again, for sure. Yeah. Oh, Ken, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us, for your heart, for just um, just that, that you are still continuing to just make this world a more tremendous place. So thank you for all you've meant to me. You've been there since I got back. Not an email, text, or phone call. Two seconds later, you're back in touch. I can't thank you enough for that. Well, God bless you. I love you. Love you too, Ken. All right, take care. And thanks so much to our listeners for this tremendous leadership podcast, Leaders on Leadership. Leave us a rating, a like, share us. We're everywhere. Thanks so much and have a tremendous day. Thank you for listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Find out more about Dr. Jones at www.tremendousleadership.com. If you've been ignited by something you heard in this episode, let us know by leaving a review for Tremendous Leadership wherever you listen to podcasts or by sending us a message through www.tremendousleadership.com.